And again, good morning, everyone, and to uh, County Council and staff. I guess that's a rerun. <laughs> again, good morning, County Council, staff, and the viewing public for today's County Council. At this time, I'll ask the uh, Madam Clerk to do the roll call, please. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Councilor Mackey. Present. Councilor Gamble. Present. Councilor Burley sends his regrets. Councilor Carlton. Present. Deputy Warden McQueen. Present. Councilor Desai. Present. Councilor Patterson. Present. Councilor Fleet. Present. Councilor Clumpus. Present. Councilor Keaveny. Present. Councilor Thomas. Here. Councilor O'Leary. Councilor Debreen. Councilor Millen. Present. Councilor Soever will be joining us later. Councilor Bourdignon. Present. Councilor Robinson. Present. Councilor Hutchinson. Present. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk, for, for doing that. At this time, we'll do our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect the history, the spirit, spirituality, and the culture of the honest Nami and Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee, and the Windat, Wyandot, and Wyandot people, peoples on whose tr traditional territories we gather, whose ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and Inuit, whose ancestors shared these, this land and these waters. May we all, as treaty people, live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all the diverse peoples. As we have, oops, as we have a, an agenda that was on our website in front of everyone today, is there a declaration of pecuniary interest with the members uh, around today today's table? Okay, if one does arise, you can declare it at that time. We have the adoption of uh, County Council and Committee of the Whole Minutes of May May twelfth. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the Councilor Millen and uh, uh, Councilor Patterson? Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That was carried unanimously. Okay, thank you. We also have the minutes of the Long-Term Care Committee of Management. Minutes dated May 10th, 2022. And can I have a mover and seconder for those, please? Uh, Councilor Carlton and uh, Councilor Robinson. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of those minutes? Those carried unanimously, okay. Moving on then to closed meeting matters. There are none uh, on our council meeting for today. There are uh, two bylaws. Does uh, anybody wish to pull those bylaws to separate uh, vote or discussion? If not, can I have a mover and seconder for those? Councillor Clumpus, Councillor Mackey. I'll get uh, Peter the next time. Any discussion on those bylaws? And that's for bylaw 5137.22 and 5138.22. Seeing no discussion on those bylaws, all in favor of those? That was carried unanimously. And we get to the best part of good news and celebrations. And I know there's everybody here is itching to get talking about all the good news. And uh, who's going to go? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Desai, start off with. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Deputy Warden Hicks. Um, unfortunately, um, I'm bringing two pieces of news. Sorry, sorry, what were you saying? Ah. Sorry. It's, it's a habit. Uh, sorry, Deputy Warden McQueen. Um, Unfortunately, I'm bringing two pieces of um, news which are neither good news nor are they celebratory. Um, <clears throat> uh, the first, obviously, is uh, two days ago, uh, 21 kids or 19 kids and two teachers were killed in a in a school uh, where you know you don't expect to uh, to to not come home from. Um, it's a tragedy, and I think all of us agree that it's a tragedy, and, and not here to talk about the tragedy itself. I'm not here to talk about gun control, although 
It took one mass shooting in England, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and several other first world countries for there to be uh, effective gun legislation, which has, um, by statistics, it shows that the incidence of gun control has, uh, gun violence has been reduced, and the incidence of crimes using other tools hasn't increased. What I am here to say, though, is that um, we as citizens and us at this table as leaders within our respective communities need to be aware that there are people uh, within our communities who want unfettered access to guns. There are people within our communities who want their, who would rather have armed security guards at our schools um, just so that they can have unfettered access to guns. We're seeing the, the, the gun mania creep into, onto our side of the border. We're seeing the politics creep onto our side of the borders. We've, we've lost uh, decorum in our politics. We've lost the ability to debate without thinking that the person we're debating is our, is our enemy. And I just want us to be mindful of that um, so that we don't get to that point where we're unwilling to make the smallest of changes under under you know go through the smallest of inconveniences just so we as a society can be safer the other piece of information i wanted to bring to this council was with regards to um a vote that was passed yesterday um at uh, durham county um it was an 11 to 6 vote i believe to add 9000 acres of farmland uh, into their urban growth um boundary to develop, and a very large portion of this into detached single family homes. Um, I posted, one of my contacts posted this to social media, I've shared it to my social media. And since then, I've gotten into at least one debate about why are we bringing people into our community? Why are we bringing more people into our community? Um, a debate about why higher density is not a good thing. Uh, one of the things they said was, maybe we need to tell these people that farther north is an option. Um, and this ties back to when at the last council meeting, uh, Deputy Warden McQueen, we spoke about um, wanting higher density in Gray County. We spoke about the dangers of NIMBYism within our community. And um, prior to that, I think I think it was last month, uh, Peel Region voted to add 11,000 of, uh, of, of uh, agricultural 11,000 acres of agricultural land into their urban growth uh, area. So we're seeing this loss of farmland and in return, we're not seeing the high density growth. And I, I just wanted to bring uh, that to this council as well, that once, as you said last time, once farmland's gone, it's gone. Um, so I'm, I'm really sorry I haven't brought any uh, good news or celebrations, uh, but I'm sure my colleagues around the table uh, will do that for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Desai. And I guess the good news is, is we're looking at density, right? So thank you for that. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Deputy Warden McQueen. Good morning, County Council. This is with regards to the major structural fire in our downtown core last Thursday. On behalf of the town of Hanover, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to CAO Kim Wingrove, Anne-Marie Shaw, Director of Community Services and her team and their partner agencies. Also, Gray County Paramedics, and Rob Hatton with the communications department. A thank you for their professional, efficient, and compassionate response to a number of individuals who were displaced by this fire. I also wanna praise the efforts of our fire department and first responders and the neighboring fire departments for their assistance. In total, there were five fire departments on site battling this fire. Thank you to the Walkerton Fire Department, the Elmwood Fire Department, the West Gray Fire Durham Station, and the West Gray Newstead Station. Our community and our neighbors came together to support those in need. Individuals, organizations, businesses, and churches all provided support. Some opened their doors, others provided food, money, and clothes. I thank them all. Thank you. 
Thanks for bringing that forward to Councillor Patterson. And I, I know speaking with Councillor Sleet this morning, he said there was two young officers that were driving by that, I don't know if you want to speak to that or not, but I think uh, they're sort of heroes themselves, right? Actually, I can say those two officers probably saved lives because when they were driving down Main Street, they noticed the smoke, uh, got into the building, started breaking down doors and telling everybody to get out. And they were the ones that called the fire department. So there probably were lives saved, undoubtedly. Thanks for bringing that forward. And thanks for staff and everyone here for uh, taking part of that as well. And Councillor Keeveney. Thank you very much, Deputy Warden McQueen, and good morning, County Council and everyone. And just wanted to first start by saying thank you to Councillor Desai for his comments. And uh, you've got us all thinking on those this morning and uh, very pleased to hear from uh, uh, Councillor Patterson that there were no lives lost in Hanover. And uh, something of a bit more on the uh, good news side of things, um, our uh, Rotary Club of Meaford will be celebrating their 85th anniversary on June the 4th. And it's going to be uh, quite a festive event at our Meaford Harbour Pavilion starting at uh, 1 p.m. There will be a dedication of that pavilion to uh, Russ Bumstead, who was responsible for organizing the building of that back in uh, 1990. And there will be uh, certainly uh, our, our mayor, uh, Barb Clumpus, will be speaking at the event, as well as some other uh, dignitaries. And there will be uh, a bar operated by our Kinsman Club, and the Rotary will be doing their traditional barbecue. And at 2.30, um, Board of Education will play, a group of retired teachers who are actually really good. And uh, Rotary History Books will be for sale. So this 85th anniversary book is really interesting and uh, really speaks incredibly well to all of the accomplishments of Rotary in our community. So if anyone is able to join us, we'd love to see you there. Thank you. Keep remembering. I have Peter Boganyan. Bogan I'm trying to get that right. So that's okay. Closer. That's Go okay, ahead. Deputy Warden. Thank you so much. Um, just um, a celebration of uh, of life um, is happening Saturday at the outside town hall for um, Deputy Mayor Rob Potter, who unfortunately passed away in November of last year and was a great county councillor for, I believe, uh, two and a half years. Um, we're dedicating some trees right outside town hall. That's at ten thirty on Saturday. Um, it was a uh, we did something similar about a month ago for um, Bob Gamble um, at the Trestle Bridge. So Saturday morning at ten thirty is just a celebration to, to dedicate uh, dedication of trees for Rob's life. So I uh, just want to make the county council aware of that. So thank you, Deputy Warden. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Any other good news and celebrations? Anybody? Um, a quietness. I go ahead, uh, Council Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Warden, and good morning, County Council. Uh, this is uh, National Paramedics uh, Week, so I just wanted to extend a sincere thanks to our paramedic services. They're there, as Council Patterson mentioned, when we need them the most. And uh, so, anyways, um, I think it's worthy of recognition. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that forward. Thank you. Oh, okay, Councillor Fleet, go ahead. Uh, good morning, County uh, Council, and uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Warden uh, McQueen. Um, Saturday, June 4th is the opening day of Hanover Raceway uh, for all you racing fans. Uh, it's nice to see the raceway up and going again with the pandemic opening. Uh, post over, uh, post time is 1.30, so come on out and enjoy some live racing at Hanover Raceway and uh, spend a couple of dollars. Thank you. And bring lots of money. <laughs> Okay, uh, other good news and celebrations? Oh, we got, oh, go ahead, Councillor Keeveney. Thank you, Deputy Warden McQueen. And I just wanted to add to uh, Councillor Mackey's comments that uh, paramedic Darren Clock has joined the uh, the doctors who have gone to uh, Poland to provide assistance there. And everyone will remember Darren. He is a Meaford uh, boy and he was here just uh, our last meeting receiving a recognition. So I uh, just wanted to add that uh, our own paramedic is uh, doing outstanding service in Poland. Thanks for sharing that. And Jill, you have some great news about the uh, Grey Roots that's coming up. Good morning, County Council and Deputy Mayor, uh, Deputy Warden. 
Um, I'm here this morning to extend an invitation to a ribbon cutting ceremony at Grey Roots for Zeus's Place, our new children's gallery sponsored by Fairmont Security. The event includes activities for kids, remarks from the acting warden McQueen um, and gallery sponsor Thomas Wielden. A ribbon cutting ceremony and ice cream to finish off the day. Uh, the gallery has been soft launched for the last couple of months and we've already seen families really enjoying the space and using all the handheld um, activities for kids. So you, we hope you can join us for this fun filled ceremony. We'll uh, follow up with an email invitation, but I just wanted to let you know the invitation is on your tables. Thank you. Well, thank you. And are you anticipating a busy summer? Yes, of course, we're uh, really looking forward to this summer. We just had a spring into Morriston event this past uh, Saturday, which was really well attended. Hundreds of people, people stayed for hours. We got out into the village, um, had refreshments. It was really great to see music and life back in the village. Thank you for that again. Any other good news and celebrations? Um, I will say that uh, I attended the uh, uh, celebration of life and funeral for Al Bai, who was a past warden for 90, 80, no, 95 and 99. And uh, I wasn't able to attend the honor guard, but at a council meeting that day, I'm not sure if others that did. And also George Schaefer, his uh, celebration of life is coming up on June 4th. And he was a past warden, I think 1983. I think I was looking back there somewhere. Mm -hmm looking back there and again there's an honor guard uh for that as well and the honor guard for those maybe don't understand what that means is uh all the past wardens are invited to attend that funeral and uh we stand in a row in the sense uh, uh to honor the and respect the past warden that uh, has served here at gray county so um no other oh go ahead uh, uh county councillor count compass go ahead Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Warden, and good morning, County Council. I just wanted, just got notice right now, so I thought I'd bring it to everyone's attention. Beginning next week is National Accessibility Week, uh, celebrated across the country, and uh, we will be raising our fl the flag in Meaford in uh, celebration of all of the uh, work that has been done by our Accessibility Committee, and uh, very, very proud of the work that they've accomplished, so I thought I'd bring that to everyone's attention. No, very important. Uh, very important that that moves forward. Is uh, I think is it twenty twenty five? We're supposed to be all fully accessible as far as municipal municipalities and that sort of those, right? So, Councillor Millen, I thought you'd have something to say this morning, but <laughs> you're going to attend the rodeo that's coming up in in Grey Highlands this this coming weekend. So I, I put some placards on the on the, on your desk there to take a look at. So. All right, so if that's, uh, there's no more good news and celebrations, so I'll, I'll, I need a mover and a second or two adjourned. Councillor O'Leary and Councillor Hutchison, all in favor? That was carried unanimously, okay. All right, then switching over to our Committee of the Whole uh, agenda that was uh, published on our website, there is a slight change uh, to that. And um, I guess, Madam Clerk, you're going to speak to, but I have a declaration of, of, of interest, but I almost need to add that if we're going to add that and then go back. Right. So uh, there is an, uh, an item to be added for in, in camera. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, Madam Clerk to speak to it. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, an item has come to our attention late last night related to um, an ongoing Ontario Land Tribunal hearing and we are requesting council uh, approve an amendment to the agenda to add a closed meeting um, item to the end of the agenda after items for discussion in accordance with our procedural bylaw. We do require a two thirds majority vote. So um, once we have a motion on the floor moved and seconded, then um, Deputy Warden McQueen will be looking for a two thirds vote in order to add a closed session to the end of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So moved by Councillor Millen and moved by Councillor Robinson. The, the amendment will require two thirds vote that the committee of the whole agenda dated May 26, 2022 be amended to add a closed meeting matter regarding a proceeding in front of the Ontario Land Tribunal. Uh, the two items advice subject to solicitor client privilege, including communication necessary for that purpose, litigation or potential litigations, including matters before the administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board. 
Any discussion there? All in favor of that motion? Okay, that was carried unanimously. So that was added to the agenda. So now I'm going to go back to, since that is added, is there any declaration of uh, pecuniary interest with regards to the agenda that's been amended? Okay, seeing none then, if one does arise. So we do have our consent agenda items. Are there any of those items wish to be pulled for separate discussion and motion? I know there was a lot of discussion on the uh, the economic development uh, advisory committee, but uh, a lot of good stuff was discussed there. But uh, if there isn't any uh, to be pulled, then it can have a move on a second for a consent agenda. Councilor Keaveny and Councilor Compass. I guess there's no discussion there. All in favor of that? That was carried unanimously. Okay. Items for discussion, item A with regards to the expropriation uh, process and uh, our solicitor will be uh, speaking to that. So good morning. Oh yes, that's right. I need to move on a second. Councillor Mackey and Councillor Debreen. Good morning, Deputy Warden and uh, County Council. Uh, I'm speaking to you today about report LSR CW0122 in respect of expropriation procedures. I'll be presenting the report, but Lacey Thompson, contract and real estate coordinator from the clerk's office joins me in making the report. Lacey, as you know, is responsible for organizing the county's realty matters. <coughs> Excuse me. This report intends to fill in some of the procedural framework under the county's current acquisition of land policy with respect to the use of expropriation. The policy notes uh, that expropriations may be used to acquire land, but they don't address that process in any detail. This report intends to provide a further framework around those processes. I should note at the beginning of this presentation that this report does not identify any land that expropriation may be considered for. It is only with respect to the process that staff would seek to follow in bringing forward the subject of expropriation to County Council. The expropriation process is one that seeks fairness for both landowners and expropriating authorities. It seeks to ensure that landowners receive fair market value for land that is necessary for the objectives of public bodies. As a municipality, the county has the power to expropriate land. This is provided for in the Municipal Act 2001. Landowners who have their land expropriated, uh, who have the land sought to be expropriated, have the right to have that land expropriation be considered fair, sound, and reasonably necessary in the achievement of the objectives of the expropriating authority. That comes directly from the statute. They also have the right to fair market compensation for the value of their land and for fair compensation for the expenses they are put to through that compensation process and they have a right to a fair and independent process to consider both of those topics. Those are the standards for the act. I'll briefly touch on the overall flow of the expropriation process and how staff proposed to bring expropriation matters to county council's consideration. However, before I should do this, I should also note that staff feel that the most cost-effective process for acquiring land is by agreement on a willing buyer, willing seller basis. This is the process that staff have conventionally used for the acquisition of land. It's the process staff would intend to continue to follow for the acquisition of land. The purpose of bringing this report forward today is to address circumstances where property has been identified as necessary for county projects, but appropriate terms could not be reached with the relevant uh, potential seller. Under the Expropriations Act, an expropriating authority, that's the term that the act uses, such as the county can issue a notice that it seeks to uh, seeks approval to expropriate a property. Notice of that uh, application for approval is given to the affected landowner or landowners, and it is given to the general public. Any owner that's affected can apply to the Ontario Land Tribunal for what's called a hearing of necessity. That hearing, uh, in that hearing, if one is requested, the expropriating authority must present the justification for their expropriation and explain why it is necessary for the expropriating authority's objectives. The approval cannot, if once the hearing's requested, approval can't be given until that hearing has been held and the hearing officer issues a report. That report goes to the approval authority and that report addresses the question, is the expropriation fair, sound, and reasonably necessary 
in the achievement of the objectives of the expropriating authority. The request for expropriation is then considered by the approval authority. A little bit unusually in the case of municipalities such as the county, uh, but also with school boards, they are their own approval authorities. So if the county sought to approve land, it would come back before county council in its capacity to function as an approval authority to approve the expropriation. If the hearing of necessity was held, the report would be presented to the approval authority and the approval authority must consider the report. They are free to accept it or not, but they need to consider it before making a decision on the expropriation. Once uh, it reaches the approval stage, the approval authority may approve the expropriation as requested. It may approve it subject to limited, uh, a limited scope of modifications, uh, or it may reject the expropriation. If approval is granted, the expropriating authority then has three months to register on title to the affected lands, a survey plan called an expropriation plan. When that is registered, that triggers the transfer of ownership of the land from the owner to the expropriating authority. That also triggers a statutory right to compensation under the act. Prior to that, there's no statutory right to compensation and the parties are always free to reach an agreement uh, to purchase the property amicably at any point up to that uh, registration of that plan. Once the plan is registered and ownership has transferred, the expropriating authority is legally required under the act to pay compensation in accordance with the act. The expropriating authority and the landowner can negotiate and come to an agreement on the compensation, or the uh, expropriated landowner may seek to have compensation determined by the Ontario Land Tribunal. Determinations of uh, value for expropriation are typically made on the basis of appraisals done by qualified certified appraisers, typically through the uh, Appraisal Institute of Canada. That's the process at a high level. There's a number of smaller and more technical steps in the overall process. There's a chart in the staff report that presents some of them, uh, but that's the, at a high level, that's what it is. The circumstances that staff have identified where they may, may wish to bring forward a discussion on expropriation are these. The first are situations where the landowner is not willing to engage in negotiations with the county for land that's necessary for a capital project. Second are situations where the landowner has engaged in negotiations, but seeks a price or other compensation that staff cannot recommend to county council as a fair market uh, price for a voluntary purchase. In light of this, what staff are seeking is council's authorization to bring forward reports when they have identified that expropriation should be considered in order to authorize uh, expropriation to go forward. Those reports would identify the following points. The land that's involved with the expropriation, the county project that's involved and the reasons why the land is necessary for the project. The reasons why staff have determined that the land cannot be purchased by a voluntary agreement at a fair market price and an estimate of the value of the land proposed to be acquired and an estimate of the proposed, the costs of the expected expropriation. Such a report would seek direction from county council with respect to expropriation on that particular property. It would be subject to any conditions that county council would seek to place on that direction. Uh, and any expropriation process is proposed to be overseen by the legal services department and the chief administrative officer. So that's the end of my summary and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thanks, Michael. And uh, questions, go ahead, Councillor Millen and then Councillor Robinson. Sorry. Thank you uh, for that uh, comprehensive report, Michael. Um, is there an opportunity through that whole process for the landowner in question to come before county council and plead their case? Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Warden, thank you, Councillor Milne. That's a good question. And County Council would certainly have the ability to hear from whoever it chose in a given matter, including the landowner. At any time in the process or up until that, or whatever that was, those big words. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 
I, I would expect so, subject to any considerations from the clerk or any other questions with respect to council process. Madam CEO, yeah, Paul. Thanks, Deputy Warden. Um, I guess an excellent question, and certainly, um, as would um, a, a property owner or, or others who wish to come before council, I think we would suggest that uh, and they would have the opportunity to delegate as anyone would. Um, and whether or not that happened at the very beginning of the process or at the time council was um, considering the uh, uh, the report of the hearing officer, one or the other of those two times, I think would be would be best so that you had an opportunity to hear from them at the time that you were making your decision. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilor Robinson. Thank you, Madam CEO. Thank you, Deputy Warden, and good morning, uh, County Council. Uh, very much appreciate this report. And within the um, the flow chart, I was wondering if there was an opportunity to identify reasons um, or alternatives to the uh, potential property. So within the entire process, would there be um, information given that suggested uh, here are some alternates to the um, this entire process for the specific land or suggesting that this is the only process uh, that would work in, in a particular capital project. Thank you. For you, Mr. Deputy Warden, thank you, Councillor Robinson. Again, another very important question. Uh, yes, I'd see there's at least two opportunities that exist there. One is the formal uh, hearing of necessity process that the landowner has the statutory right to to even take it to a third party to say, is this really necessary? Uh, the other process would probably come up with respect to the direction that is sought by staff to initiate the expropriation process. It would be very much dependent on the nature of the specific capital project and how tied it is to a precise physical space and the overlap of that project's footprint with the respective lands. But there would be an opportunity, I would think, in there to discuss that and for county council to seek relevant information from staff. I think the key thing you have to justify it also. You got to justify the expropriation very clearly, too, right? So thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Mackey. Thank you, Deputy Warden. And thanks very much, Michael. Uh, a couple of questions. One, the arbitration process, how lengthy is that and how much or how costly is that? And would that be taken into consideration when determining the fair compensation for a landowner if we can avoid going to arbitration? That's the first question. And then just wondering if you give uh, a couple examples of in the past where Gray County has had to expropriate land. Is it primarily in relation to the roads department, I would assume, but just wondering if you could provide some examples. Thank you. Three, Mr. Deputy Warden, thank you again. Um, I'll take the two questions in order. With respect to the arbitration cost, it is a little bit dependent likely on the nature of the specific property being expropriated um, because the, it may vary for any number of factors that are relevant to the landowner. And um, I think what you'd find is that there's still an ability to agree compensation after the title is taken to the property before a determination is made in arbitration. There's always a room to negotiate in there, which is an excellent opportunity to move away from the question of the, trans the transfer of the ownership of land simply to the valuation. And in there, that may require, that may not require an arbitration to be reached. That said, it is in um, the landowner's absolute right to take it there, um, but there are arguments to be made in terms of the efficiency, effectiveness, and the relative lack of stress of reaching what would may be seen as the same result before arbitration as would be reach, reached after arbitration. Uh, the second question, with respect to examples where the counties had to expropriate, honestly, I'm not aware of, certainly none has been required since I've been here and staff haven't identified any that's in recent memory. Uh, we have been able to achieve in many circumstances uh, appropriate agreed purchases. Uh, increasing difficulties are arising in trying to reach 
uh, certain agreements and staff wanted to have the process in place where we may be able to bring uh, matters forward for specific expropriations to county council's consideration. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam CEO, you have something to add? Um, Michael, will you advise council? We did some research into what's happening in, in other jurisdictions. Do you want to speak to that? Sure, you, Mr. Deputy Warden. The, uh, we are aware that the County of Simcoe uh, often pursues expropriations. They have a specific uh, policy in place that follows a, a similar basic structure as what's been outlined here. They're specifically run through their uh, their county council. Uh, we're also aware that the County of Wellington uh, carries out expropriations from time to time, but we haven't tracked down details on their policy. Uh, I don't have specific knowledge with respect to what may be done in uh, Bruce County or some of the others, or Dufferin or the others, but the that's simply that we have not seen any recent examples of it. It is also pursued in other uh, jurisdictions as well, again, in circumstances where I think you'd find similar to this, we've not been able to achieve, um, the municipality's not been able to achieve an agreement, but the land is still necessary for a project. Okay, thanks, Michael. Uh, any other comments, questions to, the, oh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Keevney. Thank you, Deputy Warden McQueen, and uh, thank you, Michael. And just uh, two quick things. First of all, I'm wondering if the process speaks to how many appraisals are required, and secondly, if this report could be shared with our lower tiers. Through you, Mr. Deputy Warden. Um, second point first, yes, it's a public report and could certainly be shared uh, with lower tiers or anyone else. Uh, the first question, number of appraisals required depends a little bit on how the process goes through. If you reached arbitration, you would expect a minimum of two appraisals to have been obtained. One is typically obtained by the expropriating authority. The landowner may obtain uh, a separate one. Other appraisals may be sought as part of an agreed uh, negotiation, but you would expect as the expropriating authority, if you were going into the arbitration to come in with an appraisal and you'd be expected to meet an appraisal from the landowner's side. Okay, thank you for that. I think one of our examples of, of taking land or, or appropriating land is probably road widening, but we seem to always able to work through that and, and you don't have to get into that. But that does, that's the thing that comes to my mind is road widening, right? So any other comments, questions from that? All right, seeing none. Thanks, Michael. And uh, call the vote then. All in favor of that report. That's carried unanimously. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks, Michael, again. All right, so then moving on to our next next report with regards to, I never find it here, uh, sign and payment conditioning index. Am I got that one right? That's right. Okay, so uh, Trevor and uh, so I need a mover and a seconder to put that on the floor. Councillor Carlton and Councillor Desai. Uh, thank you, Deputy Warden, and good morning, County Council. Um, I'm really pleased to bring you this report today to discuss an exciting opportunity related to our inventory data collection and our annual pavement condition index uh, inspections, better known as PCI inspections. Transportation services staff are continuing to work on improving our data and condition information for all road-related asset inventories within the County of Gray. The importance of asset, accurate asset data is becoming more and more essential from both the work management and asset management perspective. Earlier, earlier this year, as part of our CityWorks so, uh, work management software implementation, staff identified the need to update the asset inventory information for our county owned road signs. The existing data set within GIS is outdated and does not reflect what is currently found in the field. This makes it challenging for staff as they're unable to rely on the data in any way. Uh, further missing data also means that staff are unable to record maintenance costs and work history against these road signs within CityWorks. Engineering staff have also been considering the switch to automated PCI inspections for several years now. Unfortunately, the cost of the technologies available have been a major deterrent 
when compared to the cost of completing these inspections uh, internally. However, newer camera-based technologies have allowed for a more cost-competitive solution when compared to existing LiDAR technology, while still providing accurate and bias-free data concerning our, the condition of our roads. This is where the IRSCO solution comes in. The IRSCO camera is a small camera unit that is installed in the front window of any of our county vehicles. The installation is quite simple and requires a few hours of our mechanics time to install and hook it up to the uh, fuse box. The camera then continuously records road imagery as the vehicle is driven along the county roads as part of our routine patrols. The data is uploaded automatically to the IRIS servers where it is processed and analyzed using machine-based learning models and artificial intelligence. What is great about this is that the models themselves can be adapted to and trained to detect any new signs that are custom to the county. Uh, for example, some of our county uh, road number plaque signs, those would be, um, we would send imagery to the IRIS group and they would train the model to detect those signs so that when the vehicle's driving around in the field, they can pick up those signs, including all the regulatory and uh, warning signs in the field. Along with this, the model will also collect sign information uh, and other attributes such as type, condition, size, uh, and it'll also be able to create or collect the spatial information, which will be used for GIS services in mapping those locations of the signs. So at this point, I'm just gonna bring, yeah, yeah the image is already up. <laughs> uh, so the other element to this is the uh, PCI inspections. Um, currently with our manual inspections, we would receive a single PCI for uh, an entire road section. Uh, and how this is conducted, some of our road sections are a couple hundred meters, some are several kilometers long. So getting an average PCI over several kilometers can be very hard to determine a treatment for a road um, of that length. However, with Iris Go, we get a PCI calculation uh, at set intervals that we define uh, for the Iris group. In this case, we're looking at uh, distances of 50 meters in our rural uh, areas and 25 meters in our urbans. So as you can see on the image uh, on screen there, there are a variety of dots. So each dot represents a singular PCI calculation along the road. Um, the green dots obviously are good condition. And as we traverse to the red, it becomes poor and extremely poor uh, condition. Now, if we take a moment to look kind of at the horizontal section there, um, kind of on the right, there's a variety of kind of green dots and then a few yellows and then a small sections of kind of dark red and uh, red as well. Now, typically our current process, uh, the evaluator would go out, he would drive that road. Uh, he'd likely notice the same sort of deficiencies. He'd see the good sections, the bad sections. Uh, and what he'd probably at the end of the day come to the conclusion that this is a road in average condition. And what then we would see in the office is basically that road would be represented with a yellow line uh, saying it's an average condition. Now, when we get into our 10 year planning process, um, we would see that it's average condition and we likely wouldn't uh, find any sort of treatments for about five to 10 year window, just because uh, most of the treatments in that range it doesn't really make sense to do much on that road. Uh, however, when we look at the um, image there, we can see that it's really just a few pockets of some red and deep red uh, condition sections or in areas of poor condition. And what we can do is we can actually now with this data, we can target some preventative maintenance such as grinding paves or um, asphalt patches and specifically go after those little red dots. And what we'll do is we'll convert them to green dots and effectively create a much better um, overall PCI for that road. Um, and obviously an increased level of service for our uh, residents. <clears throat> so this obviously has a big impact on our 10 year capital plan because it allows us to make uh, more informed decisions, uh, especially related around asset management. Now, one of the other things that sets the Iris Go solution apart is that they do the or the camera, or sorry, they do the inspections uh, based on the Ministry of Transportation's uh, condition rating for, or manual for condition rating of flexible pavements. So this manual is the same 
manual that we use internally for our manual inspections. Um, and so it allow us to use our historical inspections that we've collected over the last uh, six to eight years and utilize those in conjunction with the future ones to continue to build our depreciation curves and collect our data uh, without doing any sort of conversions or um, switches from other collection methods from other technologies. So at this point, I'm gonna sure, hopefully Tara can bring up on screen a short video. Uh, so this is the IRSCO um, software running as it's driving down the road. Um, you'll notice kind of on the surface of the pavement, you can see all the blue lines. Those are all the various cracks that are being picked up uh, and the various widths of the cracks. Um, in the top left corner, the numbers obviously probably don't mean anything to anyone, but that's effectively the ride condition of the road. So um, feeling the different bumps and how it feels for the overall driver as they're driving along the road. You'll also notice kind of on the right, there's things like a fire hydrant there being picked up and then shortly uh, the road signs will also start being picked up. And then one other thing to draw attention to, and this is a special thing that IRISCO has developed as part of their software. You'll notice the grayed out boxes around the different cars and uh, it also works with pedestrians as well. And that's to um, redact privacy information directly at the source of the video. Um, so there's, uh, basically, at any point, there's no privacy information collected as part of their solution. Okay, <clears throat> so now that we've gone over kind of how the Iris Camera Go, uh, Iris Go camera works, uh, it's important to mention why we are requesting a single source for this work. So although there are other various camera-based solutions out there in the market, this solution best aligns with the uh, current MTO specifications. Uh, utilized by county staff to allow us to draw comparisons with our existing data. Further, the camera uh, can be installed by our own mechanics in a very simple time, whereas other camera-based solutions, um, if you've seen the kind of Google Street View cameras attached to the tops of vehicles, uh, many of the other technologies use that approach. Of course, being on our vehicles, that's not the greatest thing because if you're out there uh, doing other work in the meantime, the camera is obviously cumbersome and uh, not something we want to really have um, driving around with us as we're doing some other work. Um, the estimate for this work submitted by the RS, IRIS R&D group uh, is both competitive in terms of a camera-based solution, uh, but also significantly less than other LiDAR-based technologies that we've investigated in the past. Uh, now, although it is more, or more expensive than our annual uh, internal and manual inspections, the results of these inspections are free from any subjectivity or uh, internal biases that may be present from the uh, manual inspections. They're also data driven and they can be utilized at a granular level similar to what we saw in the image before uh, relating to asset management um, decisions. And then finally, uh, another little benefit is once the road data has been captured, we can continue to extract other asset information uh, at any point. So we don't have to resend our vehicles out to go and collect more camera information. Uh, this will be important as we continue to work on our asset management and find kind of our the holes in our data so we can extract things like guide rail, uh, street lights, traffic signals, uh, other information like that uh, as we prepare for the 2024 20, deadlines for the for all. Uh, minor assets in the asset management plan. So in conclusion, staff are requesting your approval today to move forward with the single source award to the IRS R&D group for a total amount of $93,303 in HST. Uh, the 2022 budget included $50,000 to complete the annual PCI inspections, uh, but it did not include any funding for the road sign data collection portion of this work. Staff are asking that the project be funded uh, from any, sorry, the project deficit be funded from any surplus realized in the Transportation Services 2022 budget. And if no surplus is available, the amount funded from the Transportation General Reserve. Uh, thanks for your time. And I'll take any questions that you may have. Thanks, uh, Tripper. And I don't know if you were down at the Ontario Good Roads, but I think they had one of their booths there was talking about this. And I'm not sure if they're the ones that did the lunch, because I know I sat in one that had similar, I'm pretty sure it was them as well. I don't know if any others had the opportunity, so. 
Okay, I'm going to go with uh, Council Robinson first and then decide. Thank you. And through you, uh, Deputy Warden, uh, I was really excited when I read this report and I, I just see it, how it contributes to modernizing uh, Gray County overall and, and through operations. So a couple questions after reading the report. Just wondering, is there any application for IRIS uh, for the cycle path, but like the, sh the, uh, the shoulders of the road, as we do have a cycle master plan, is there a way that um, the data can contribute to the upkeep of the, um, the cycle path? Um, also, is there any application uh, with regard to bridge decks, um, recognizing that whole assessment of uh, bridge uh, maintenance and whether there needs to be reconstruction is is um, tied into studies, but just wondering if there's an application. And during the winter months, can this um, can this uh, software, if you will, determine whether there is a need to plow at a particular time, or is that just based on a, a very, very, very different uh, application? Thank you. Sure, I'll uh, I think I'll get through all three of those. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, in terms of the cycling pass, um, this is one of the reasons where it's almost like a test pilot project for us too, in a sense, uh, cause they do have, um, compliance, uh, element to this software. So that would be uh, how I could see that working with the cycling and trails is if there's, um, some sort of debris or something on the trail that's blocking it as they drive by the software will be able to detect, um, different, uh, issues with the cycling trails um to say whether there's a bunch of gravel that's spilled over or anything like that and then it can automatically synchronize to our uh, city work software to set up a work order to go and uh, address that um the second question was um <laughs> there. Uh, in terms of bridge decks it likely won't be able to do too much uh, with the bridge deck specifically, but um, the barriers and uh, maybe able to detect uh, whether some pieces are broken off or some vehicle damage or uh, basically as it drives by, it's just going to notice uh, irregularities in the imagery from each drive by. Uh, and then in terms of the winter weather conditions, uh, I can't say for certain about the snow. We could probably uh, ask about that again, because it's, ongoing as our guys are doing their winter patrols uh likely they're seeing the snow as well so um we it's probably kind of a redundant part but what it could do um in the winter it can deal with uh, retro reflectivity uh so what it'll do is a kind of a pass fail measurement on our road signs um it has to be done at nighttime so that's where we would find it best done in, in the winter uh, months but that would automatically trigger um people in our science shop to go out and actually take proper reflectivity on the ones that would fail uh, to see if we need to do any replacements. Thanks, Councillor Robinson. At this, then we'll move on to Councillor Desai and then Councillor Carlton after that. Thank you, Deputy Warden McQueen. Um, my question to Trevor through you is, he talked about the, the segmentation of the roads and um, I, I believe he said 50 meter segments. What's the point of having 50 meter segments as opposed to having a segment that goes from one intersection to the next intersection? So that whole intersection would end up being one segment. The reason I ask this is eventually, so I'm looking at figure three from the report. The, the, the road that's shown in there, the one road that goes, I'm going to assume it goes south, is a sea of red dots. So obviously you'd do something to that entire section but if if you're looking at a road and you're seeing several red spots separate from each other and you're upgrading or you're you're doing maintenance work on those to upgrade them to a green dot at at what point do you look at that and go well okay instead of doing these small upgrades every so often it's better to do one overhaul um after x number of years so I'm, I'm struggling with the rationale on having those 50 meter segments as opposed to an entire intersection. Sure, through you, Deputy Warden. Um, basically, we still have our normal road section. So we'll still be receiving that average PCI through that entire road section. Um, where this helps us is just supplementary information. We can 
if we see a road that's in generally poor condition and we go and look at it and it's pretty consistent across, obviously we'll look at doing the entire road section as one work. Um, where it becomes a benefit is seeing situations where it's you see varying degrees of uh, issues. And that's where you can start to target some preventative maintenance to try to create a more uniform uh, degradation of that road section, uh, which then would align better with full reconstructions in the future. So it's really just preserving it as long as possible till you have to do that full uh, reconstruction. So effectively it tells you what portion needs cold patching. And at one point you'll notice there's more cold patch than asphalt. And that's the point you just do the overall. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Madam Seal, did you have something to add? Thanks, Deputy Warden. Uh, two things. First of all, I wanted to say how much I appreciate all the work that transportation did in assessing the solution for us and, and bringing it forward. Not only is it critically important to transportation's future planning, but the other aspect of this is it's going to provide critical information to support us as part of any kind of an investigation or um, accident insurance claims. You all know what's happening in, in that world. Any, you know, the when we have access to better and more current information, that really is a huge help to us as we try to assess what's happened in a situation and whether other action was required. So I think it's going to serve us very well for a, for a number of uses. So thank you, Trevor and Pat. Thanks for that, Madam CEO. And I have now a, a Councillor Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Warden. I'm wondering, Trevor, if this is what uh, Ministry of Transportation is doing right now. I live in a section of highway between Springmount and Shallow Lake. And yesterday they had their roads crew out and driving that road all winter, you recognize various sections that had issues, maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 meter sections. And that's what they were doing was tearing up that section, repaving it. So thereby saving the entire road by just doing those one little sections as they went. And it made perfect sense to me. Instead of a major reconstruction when the roads got really bad, you fix the little spots that were becoming bad and save the whole road. So probably saves a lot more in dollars on road construction than we're ever going to spend on this software. So thank you. Yeah, and through you, Deputy Warden. Um, yeah, they did the same thing actually on Highway 10. I believe it was last year. There were several areas between uh, Chatsworth and Markdale, I believe, that um, I know I was driving through one day and you get stopped at all these various little patches that they're putting in. And yeah, it's really just to um, create the more uniform road and trying to fix those issues that are um, pop up. A lot of times it's just, you know, some air in the construction or just some bad compaction or something. So if you can get some of those fixed uh, earlier, obviously it helps to prolong the length of that asset and um, saves us money overall. Probably frost heaving and over years of maybe some dead sand in there as well. Um, okay, thank you for that. And then I have uh, Councillor Mackey is next. Thanks, Deputy Warden. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Trevor, for the report. Just wondering if, uh, well, one, first question, you had the uh, the type of uh, ride that you're receiving or the roughness of the road. Do we have a standard for that or will there be a standard built in that we want to achieve on our county roads? That's the first question. And the second question is, uh, if this technology is adopted, would the lower tiers be able to uh, possibly have a contract with the county to have some of our roads uh, kind of surveyed by, by this. Yeah, through you, Deputy Warden. Um, yes, the in terms of the um, what's that? <laughs> I'll talk to the kind of the lower tier part first. Um, <laughs> the basically with that, I think there would be a way that we could probably partner in some form um, because these cameras are installed individually in each vehicle. Um, that would require either us driving the municipality roads or we'd have to transfer to a different vehicle. I suspect Irisco would maybe do some sort of joint contract potentially um, if we could partner together to try and get some savings. But I would think 
likely from their point of view, they'd rather see the individual uh, partners buying the cameras to install on their vehicles. Uh, and then that way you would have your camera drive around uh, the local roads and then we would be on the county roads driving those. So uh, although there could be potential cost savings, I suspect it's probably still somewhat of a um, sort of split approach. Uh, and then the first question, sorry, was <clears throat> PCI. Yes. Yeah, the ride rating. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so to that, we ideally with this, we'll get a better barometer of um, where kind of we're at in terms of our current level of service. We, we have some from our existing um, manual inspections, but again, because those um, are obviously subjective in that, we wanna make sure that, you know, what is being detected from a more data-driven approach, it still aligns with what we have. And then assuming that's the case, we can make some decisions on kind of where we're at currently, what we're looking to be at as a county, um, all in line with the asset management plan uh, regulations as well. Um, one of the key things with the ride, and this is partially why manual inspections uh, tend to struggle, is because the ride is very subjective. Uh, as you're going down, basically it's a score of one to 10, and everyone kind of has an, a rough idea what it is, but it that ride condition weighs fairly heavily on the PCI. Um, so sometimes the ride might actually be really well and you'll see a lot of cracking, but just instinctively in your mind, you, you see the cracking and think this is much worse and you might actually mark the roads worse than they may be in reality. Um, so that's kind of where this non-subjective approach really helps to um, just kind of zone in on the actual um, targets that we're trying to achieve, so. Okay, thanks, Councillor uh, Mackey. And then we have Councillor Bergenion. Bergenion, I get it yet. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, uh, Deputy Warden um, McQueen. Um, Councillor Mackey asked one of my questions, excellent question, but the lower tier. Um, I was just wondering, is there a licensing fee uh, outside of buying the cameras? Is there any yearly licensing fee that goes along with goes along with this uh, that we need to renew, um, or is it um, a one time one time purchase? Sure, through you, Deputy Warden. Um, it is, the cameras are a one-time purchase, but there is a, I believe it's $120 for the monthly kind of service fee. Uh, and then there's, you can, if you choose to go with the more compliance route, that requires a yearly fee. Um, and I can't remember, it's around $40,000, uh, at least for the county portion. Um, and then that would be that, it would be just ongoing all the time, uh, collecting information. Um, otherwise, you can put it in a vacation mode, the camera. So you effectively cut all of your uh, licensing costs, uh, except for the $120, just as like a standby cost. So likely for us, we would complete this information and put it into a vacation mode until we come to some sort of decision, whether we move ahead with a compliance approach or um, and like the ongoing inspections, or if we just kind of do it as an annual process. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, Councillor Keeveny and then Councillor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Warden, and through you to Trevor. First of all, thank you for the report and the excellent job you're doing of providing information to County Council. That's appreciated. Um, I had two questions for you. Uh, the first one in relation to signs. So on County Roads, you're going to be picking up from the example all signs. So I'm curious to know then if there could be some communication with the lower tiers in that regard, if, if it picked up, you know, an issue with a sign or a missing sign, thinking of our sign in Bobner that disappeared and we still have no understanding of what happened to that sign if uh, if it might pick up uh, a missing sign and second of all and I know you've touched on it already Trevor but thinking of the recent storm that happened on Saturday and all the devastation in Toronto right through to Ottawa and so on and, and could this software be used um, to help to uh, to pick up those uh, sorts of problems and help the county deal with them more quickly. Uh, through you, Deputy Warden. Uh, yeah, basically with the road signs, um, for the in terms of the collection of the asset data, that will be dependent. It'll be kind of like a one-time snapshot, more or less. So that'll pick up all of the signs within the network. And then where uh, 
the compliance part comes along, that will be as it drives the road each day, it detects the sign, it sees nothing has changed with that sign, or maybe someone spray painted it, so it's gonna pick up the graffiti on the sign and obviously flag it as a replacement. Uh, same if it becomes damaged or if it goes missing, uh, it's gonna detect that there's a change there and trigger some sort of uh, work order within our system. So that's kind of where the benefit of the compliance part comes along. It helps to detect any sort of changes um, that it sees. Obviously, um, some things will change. You might see a tree down and then a week later it's gone again. So it might automatically detect that, okay, everything's gone back to normal. But yeah, they it could be used for um, checks on the basically our network to make sure that everything is just consistent. So uh, yeah, so that answers the question. Thanks for that. Just for clarity, so we have the cameras on all our vehicles. It goes out, collects the data, but then you switch it to vacation mode. So you're collecting the data, but it's not constant data. Is that what you're saying? Sorry. Yeah, so it, it can be constant. It just depends on what approach you're going with. With what we're uh, discussing today, it's specifically the collection of the signed data and then um, PCI. So once we've driven the roads, we would effectively turn it off. Um, and then depending if we go with the compliance route, that's where it would be on full time. So that's where it sits in the vehicle as you're patrolling uh, and notices any of those changes. So then from an insurance point or from due diligence, then probably the next step will be going to that all the time because it'll pick up that stop sign or it'll pick up that sign that's missing that we pick it up right away versus just collecting the first data. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, we have uh, Councillor Desai is next then. There we go. Thank you, uh, Deputy Warden Hicks. Um, my question is a follow up to Councillor Bourdignon's question. Uh, Trevor mentioned that you would put it on uh, vacation mode once you've done the analysis. Um, if it is the question of the $40,000 annual fee, why not just pay the $40,000 and have the camera be active every time someone goes out on a county road or goes out somewhere? I, I understand it's it's a heavy cost, but it does provide accurate data, up to date data. It provides you the data on the day of that drive, um, and likely it will it will it'll it'll give you an idea of how often a particular road has been traveled. So when you are doing your annual inspections or your uh, the, the annual period where your cameras are on, you could likely skip that road altogether because you have up-to-date data on that so why not just bite the bullet and pay the extra money for the more up-to-date more accurate data rather than use it for a small amount of time and then put it on vacation mode just to save money good question madam seal is going to take that first i think thanks deputy warden what we're asking for today is um, council's support to um, make this financial arrangement to procure this with uh, with the single source. This is a proof of concept for us, so we want the opportunity to um, to use the tool to understand um, that it is actually going to deliver what's been promised to us, ensure that we're able to use it effectively and manipulate and, and um, go through the information. So um, I think once we've had that opportunity, we'll be coming back to you. Um, I'd also, and I'll, I'll look to Pat or Mary Lou, I, I believe that annual that an annual cost to collect um, pavement condition index is something that has always been in the county's budget. So it's not like we would be incurring, at least at this level, a, a new expense. We might be simply redirecting the resources, um, just as you've stated, Councillor Desai. So I think what we want right now is just a, a bit of time to use the tool um, and make sure that it's going to work well. Is that fair, Trevor? I think Pat, Pat do you have a comment? You're just shaking your head saying you agree. <laughs> okay. Um, next, we have Councillor Cabrini and then Councillor Morgan Allen. Go ahead, Councillor Cabrini. Thank you. And through you, Deputy Warden, um, 
a great report, really exciting. And a lot of my questions, I think, have been asked and answered indirectly as this is a pilot project. So initially, it's a one-time cost. But if you are happy with it, they'll be coming back for budget approval. I was just wondering about the software updates. Has um, ha has there been any question about the frequency of or a requirement for software updates, or will we discover that through the pilot project exploration? Thank you. Sure. Through you, Deputy Warden. Uh, in terms of software updates, that's effectively covered within the one hundred twenty dollar kind of annual monthly fee. Uh, as we continue to use it, obviously there. Um, every sign that they put through their AI, it just becomes better and better at uh, helping to predict this stuff. So um, yeah, the more and more we get, the, they'll just routinely keep uh, updating their models and um, passing those updates on to us. Thanks for that question. And, and Councillor Borganon, you have another question? Uh, yes, it's a follow-up. Um, uh, Councillor Desai brings up an excellent point in relation to the costing. Um, you know, if we're going to do this, do it properly, and back to Councillor Mackey's original point, once the the, the Gray County roads are done, they may, I, I don't um, anticipate removing the cameras from the Gray County trucks, but maybe similar to GIS where you could um, offload some of that 40000 annual cost of sending out a, a, to the different lower tier municipalities and charging back for some kind of cost recovery. And I, th I think it would be important in almost all the municipalities to do this. And that may offset some of the $40,000 when it's distributed amongst those people, if that's an opportunity um, to number one, help offset costs and help the lower tier municipalities that don't want to make such a larger investment. So um, to Council Desai's point, if we're going to, you know, if it's a matter of cost savings, uh, maybe it's a matter of biting the bullet and doing this properly. And then we could actually, like I said, mitigate some of that cost by, um, you know, selling the data, I guess, in a, in a, but using it for the lower tier municipalities on a cost recovery basis. Sure. Through you, Deputy Warden. Uh, yeah, there's uh, obviously an opportunity to do that. Uh, the one thing I should mention too, that with the 40,000, that's uh, strictly for the compliance part, the recording of the videos. What There's also the cost for each camera that's included. Um, and I believe that's around 10,000 um, without the installation costs. So depending on whether you've got staff that can install those in the vehicles or not, there may be some additional, but um, with us being, we have four patrols, uh, we would assume that we'd probably end up going, if we went the compliance route, we'd need uh, individual cameras in each patrol. So uh, right now we've just budgeted the single camera for the this run and we're just going to move the vehicle throughout the entire county um, but again if we go the other route we'll have to look into the additional costs with the three extra cameras and then um, the compliance part again we can continue to have conversations with them about um, extending that uh, cost now the i should also mention that the forty thousand is based off of the kilometers of roads that we have uh, within the network so again if we uh, include more of the uh, member municipalities we likely see that increase uh, so again, we'll have to kind of look at what those additional costs might be and then kind of go from there. Thanks for those questions. So this is almost like a dash cam in a way, is it? Right. Because I know one of the booths down there, I'm not sure it was this company or another one, showed a lot of benefit in that dash cam in our vehicles because if things happen, it's, it captures it live. It captures it for insurance purposes. And I don't know if there's an opportunity to talk to our insurance company on moving forward with this, if there are some savings on doing it full time, as Councillor Desai and others have said, is there is there some savings on that sense, or that you know it's that due diligence? You know, I know we always heard years and years about the due diligence to make sure your signs are here, somebody's checking it off, and and all that kind of stuff. So maybe that's something as we move through that we sort of follow up. Pat, you have a comment? Yeah, I could just speak briefly to that. Yeah, so really, as Kim said, this is this is really to get our PCIs done this summer, right? Great concept. We're really excited about it. We're just not quite there with our with our uh, full compliance yet. You know, we have our compliance uh, software we use now. It's been very effective. Um, you know, we'd have to kind of rope in our risk management people. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of strain. Like when you think even our signs, so those stop ahead signs on a on a side road, like a township road, 
they're ours as well, right? So to pick them up, you're kind of driving down 300 meters of a side road. You know, ultimately, you you wonder in the long term about um, well, same as our we have we have um, you know structures on side roads that we don't patrol. Um, you know, if if we could get kind of a countywide, maybe. I mean, this is this is just you know in theory. Um, you think there'd be a lot of savings in knowing there's enough people driving around um, to really get compliance too. So that's kind of what we're excited about. We're just not, we really need to get the PCIs done now and that's all we're asking for. But um, this kind of opens the door for hopefully just more automation and, um, you know, a chance to do that going forward. More eyes in the road. <laughs> all right. Is there, are there any other last comments uh, of this new uh, technology that we're moving forward with? All right, it's, it's been moved and seconded. Is there uh, all in favor of that motion? That's carried unanimously. Shall we take a quick break? Okay. Okay, so we need to carry on with our closed session. Do you want a, a quick break? Okay, so we want a quick break, is like no more than. That's all you get. <laughs> <laughs> the CEO has got the hammer here and she says five minutes. So we'll take a five minute break.
All right, we'll call this meeting back to order and thank you, Madam Clerk, for rattling the table. So we're going to be uh, moving into a closed session. So can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councilor Hutchison, Councilor Millen. The Great County uh, Council does now move into closed session pursuant to section 239.2 of the Municipal Act 2001 to discuss a matter before the Ontario Land Tribunal with regards to litigation and potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting municipal or local boards, advice subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for the purpose, and that the following staff will remain in attendance, uh, Kim Wingrove, Randy Schwitzer, Scott Taylor, Michael Maternal, Heather Morrison, and Tara Warder. Is that it? And Rob Hatton. Okay. Oh, and we have Councillor Alar from the Town of the Mountains is in uh, attendance now. So all in favor of that motion. That's carried unanimously. Yeah, let's wait till everybody clears. 